worst on Meadow Black Media, written a whole lot of books as well, including one, uh, Ricky, The Life and Legend of an American Original. Howard, welcome to the program, mate. We've got so much to talk about. Thank you. No, thank you for having me. Well, here we are in the divisional series. First, you know, what this is the first experience we had of the wild card playoffs like they were. Uh, good idea, and has it gone down well with baseball fans? Well, I think people like it. I think people like it. Me in particular. Uh, there's there's good and bad with it, just like with everything. But I, I really do, for the most part, if we're comparing, if you're comparing the new format where you play a best two out of three and one team gets all of the home games against the one game knockout round playoff, this is a thousand percent better. It's a thousand percent better because you don't, this is not the NCAA tournament. This isn't football. You don't play 162 games in baseball and then play one game and call yourself a playoff team. Everybody deserves a series. And I think they finally got this right. The reason why it took so long to get it right was because one, the attitude was, well, if we do this, then the visiting team is not going to get a home game. And that's never happened before in the history of the, of the sport. Even the best of three National League playoffs from back in the day, back in the 50s and 60s, those were a three-game playoff, but but both teams got at least one home game. The other problem that they had had with this was if you add another round of playoffs, if you have a series instead of a knockout, then in baseball, you play every single day. So you get the first place team sitting around and they're getting rusty and they're not ready to play. And so maybe they're going to be at a disadvantage waiting for that first round to end because the first te- first place teams get a bye. And we saw that in the first games where Atlanta was rusty to start, Houston was rusty to start because they hadn't played in a week. And so I understand the, the downside, but I still think that at the end of the day, the better play is if you make the playoffs, you got to play a series. I think this is a good move. When it comes down to these divisional series now, and then we go into the championship series and things, and we're talking about this yesterday, that it, is it really a case of the cream floats to the top? You don't win 100 games without being one of the best teams. And so is it natural to just expect those top-seeded teams with the home advantage to get through? Or, or every now and again, we get to see, like, say, the Giants did, where they wriggled through with a wild card. But how difficult is it to do that, Howard, to actually to actually be on the back foot from the start and actually just having to keep winning series and, and actually playing most of your games away from home? No, I don't think it's that big a deal in baseball, and that's the reason why you play so many games in the regular season. You see, people are really big into expanding playoffs. And they want to, the leadership of this game wants to expand the playoffs because they want to be like the other sports. They want to be hip and cool and they want to be like everybody else because baseball is so rooted in its traditions. People think that the game is too stodgy. But the problem is this isn't football. This isn't hockey. And this isn't basketball. In that in baseball, the reason why so few teams make the playoffs is because only the best team should have a chance to win a championship because unlike every other sport, in baseball, you do not put your best team on the field every day. If a pitcher is your best player, that guy's only pitching once every five days. It's 20%. Right. And so if, say, Justin Verlander is your best player, then you're only putting your best team on the field 20% of the whole season. So if you do, you know, if if you add to the playoffs, then the best teams don't have the same advantage that they would normally have with shortened playoffs, because now it just becomes this random sort of game of roulette. And it undermines, it undermines the regular season. Why on earth are we playing 162 games if the Philadelphia Phillies can make the playoffs being 13 games out of first place, or the Padres can be 22 games out of first place, or the Mariners can be 16 games out of first place. Those aren't playoff teams. They don't deserve to be in the playoffs. But if you really want to be modern and if you want to be like the other sports, you're going to have teams not have great regular seasons, get into the playoffs, get hot, and win a championship. And the biggest difference is is that unlike the other sports, Home, home field advantage doesn't really mean that much in baseball. So the home team may have a slight advantage, 
But we, as we saw back in 2019 when the Nationals won the World Series, the Astros lost all four games at That's home. Right. Yeah. And so it's, it's not that big a deal. So the real issue for me is if you want to be modern, modern is going to come at a price. And that price is going to be your best teams aren't going to win as many championships as maybe they should. Howard Bryant with us from ESPN, also a Hall of Fame voter. And we're talking MLB and all about these these playoffs. Are they going to extend it even further? And I'm groaning just by even saying that. I mean, because it just seems the way of the world these days. We want more. We want we we want it faster. You know, the people's attention span seems so. You know, thirty second, and, and that's about it. As long as it's a TikTok, then they can cope with it. Anything else, they can't. And also just because it increases, as it's such a big money winner. So, is there even more plans? Do you think to actually? And and what would that do if they did? Yeah, I think that there's always going to be talk about expanding the playoffs, but I think that baseball has to have a limit because you have to remember the greed factor because people are greedy bastards around here. Yeah. And in being in being that greedy, you will have owners who may want to expand the playoffs, but they don't want to shorten the season because they don't want to lose any home dates. They don't want to give up any money. So if you don't want to give up any money, it's bad enough right now that you've got, like you said, the Padres with 22 games out of first place. And you were talking earlier about these about these teams being clearly the best teams. Well, the other thing that you have in, in baseball now is you have a lot of teams tanking. They're losing on purpose. So and what that does is that inflates the win totals of teams like the Dodgers. The Dodgers won 111 games. I mean, it's only been done four or five times in history where a team has won more than 110 games. And so to, to see that happening, to see the Giants win 107 games, to see the Red Sox win 108 a couple of years ago, to see the Dodgers win 111 this year, it makes me wonder just how good these teams are if a lot of bad teams are rolling over, not trying to win. I've got some questions here just about the um, the Hall of Fame for you. But before we do that, Aaron Judge's season. Uh, this but I also inc- didn't answer your question. I'm sorry. I that's right. No, no, no. That's question, no, I think which, I, I think yeah. you did. Aaron Judge's season. Um, and, you know, you can put all the stats and everything else around it. And, you know, and, 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 I, and I love the way that ESPN come up. They come up with the most <laughs> incredible stats. Uh, where he stacks, the names that are associated with him. But just removing all of that, just in terms of today's baseball, today's pitching, what what does his season mean? How significant is it? And can it be repeated? Extremely significant season. Aaron Judge had a fantastic year. And to hit 62 home runs, to do what he did, to do it when a lot of the players on the Yankees weren't even in the lineup. I mean, he was the engine of that entire team all season long. So there's no taking away anything that he did, especially in a game today where pitchers and pitching is not – nearly what it was in terms of getting getting different types of velocity and getting different types of variety today everybody blazes everyone's throwing 100 miles an hour and so to do what he did against a a much more increased velocity game pitching wise maybe these pitchers don't have the same skill that the old old timers had but they certainly throw much much harder so there's no question that what he did is is absolutely remarkable. Can somebody else hit 62? You know, I don't. It's it is a this is the reason why it was such a remarkable thing in the 90s and the 2000s when this was happening because no, those numbers you don't get those numbers very often, and that's the reason why you have these fractures in the game. I think one of the most difficult things for Aaron Judge this year, in in my opinion, was. It was he reminded us by his remarkable year that the wounds of the drug era of the steroid era have have not been healed. They're still very much open wounds. There's a reason why these guys don't hit 60 without performance enhancing drugs. And so so much of what he did was overshadowed by the idea of what is legitimate, what wasn't legitimate, whether or not this is the real home run record when, hey, the real record is 73. It's Barry Bonds' record. And if you really, really cared about your records and if you cared about the integrity of your game, you would have done something about it back then. You didn't. And so now everyone has to live with it. 73 is the record. Speaking about that, and you get to vote for the Hall of Fame. Um, and look, I'm you know living in New Zealand, 12,000 miles away. It's none of our business, of course. But of course, you know, with the way the world is now, I mean, we, you know, we get to see baseball. We get to comment. We get to talk oh, about it. like baseball. It's yeah. your business. Absolutely. Oh, thank you, Howard. Well, business. you know, when it comes to well, the... We ho- do call it the World Series. Yeah, <laughs> good point. <laughs> when it comes to the Hall, Hall of Fame, though, 
Do you guys ever sort of sit down and say, hey, look, you know, not putting people in, putting people in, the whole steroid era and everything else, isn't it? wouldn't it be better just to put an asterisk beside some people's names and say, hey, this also happened and just let the fans decide for themselves? Because I've kind of flipped and flopped with Barry Bonds. At first I thought, oh, no, he can't go to the Hall of Fame. And now I kind of think he still hit 73 home runs, regardless of how he did it. I would like to see his bus there just with a, you know, the other bit of the story attached and then let people decide whether they want to accept it or not. Is that a good idea or not? Yeah, I think it's fine. And I'm in the same category. I've never voted for Barry Bonds and I didn't vote for a lot of, if there's any player that I think was suspected of using performance enhancing drugs, I didn't vote for them. And that means I didn't vote for a lot of people. Barry Bonds is the greatest baseball player I've ever seen with my own two eyes. And I never voted for him. And there are times when I felt like that was appropriate because of what he did and the way he handled himself about it and all of that. But I also feel like when you're looking at it, maybe I'm just getting soft in my old age, when you start looking at the penalties here, it's very, very obvious that Barry Bonds is one of the greatest players who ever lived. It's also very obvious that if Barry Bonds is admitted into the Hall of Fame, as I keep saying, if he gets into the Hall, he earned it. And if he doesn't, he also earned it. And so my attitude on that is it's almost like the the distinction between between life in prison or parole. In, in with a parole case right now, everybody knows that Barry Bonds is a first ballot Hall of Famer. Everybody knows that Barry Bonds is one of the greatest we've all ever seen. And if it so turns out that he gets in, for him to get in 11 or 12 years after his eligibility, I think that's punishment enough. Everybody knows that he's not a 12th ballot Hall of Famer. He's a first ballot Hall of Famer. So people know that if it took that long to get in, then there was something amiss about his candidacy. And finally, Pete Rose, what are your thoughts on that? Has, 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 has the attitude towards him softened over the years? Because, I mean, it, it went to a stage where it got yeah, kind it's of... It's gotten worse. It's gotten worse? Wow. Mm, it's gotten worse. And it's, got, it's gotten worse because of his personal life, because of all the different scandals that he's been involved in. I would have thought it was going to go in the other direction. And I thought it was going to go in the other direction because... Baseball and all of sports right now have gone a thousand percent in on gambling. They're all gambling now. It's public. And yeah. they, they you know, all the, you know, whether it's DraftKings or FanDuel or Caesars or Bally's, they're all gambling and they're all making it very public and they're all making boatloads of money off of it. But Pete Rose is a separate category in a lot of ways, not just because gambling was illegal when he was doing it, but also because he he bet on his own team. And you can't do that. And, and in addition to that, you know, baseball has a very, very long memory. And I just don't see, I don't see them saying, well, we changed the rules for him. Um, so therefore, we changed the rules. Therefore, for him, his situation changes because his situation is so much more complicated than the simple rules of gambling. At that time, you cheated. And that's that.